Perfect. Perfect. All right, then it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Anna David. Um, and she's going to tell us all about uh, classical machine learning for quantum simulations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Agnes. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here. It's also a super great pleasure to be here and present the results. Um, I will start by saying that uh, I, succ I succumbed to the temptation of uh, trying to show more results than I should in the 45 minutes. That being said, please interrupt me. I would much prefer to have it more interactive than just you know, present all the content. So please ask questions. I'm super happy to discuss. Uh, so I'd like to start, uh, given that uh, we had lots of amazing applications of ML for quantum physics already in this conference and in, this, in, this, uh, in, the, in the school, I feel like what was missing maybe is, was indicating some of the limitations of ML. So we, are, we can use it in a more conscious way. So I will, I will start by giving the a more like um, a bit critical <laughs> introduction to ML. Uh, so then we can be really, really uh, know what's need, what's, what we need to improve uh, to make ML a powerful tool for quantum sciences. And then I will show you two sets of preliminary results. One is closer to being finished, the other not so much. Uh, and, uh, and then I will, I will show you the, the outlook and summary. So let's, let's start with the introduction. Uh, so as to me, one of the most excited, uh, exciting uh, challenges of quantum physics nowadays are, uh, are the following. And you already seen during this conference that many of these challenges, such as uh, detection uh, of novel phases of matter, such as of finding ground states of uh, quantum anybody Hamiltonians, such as in, uh, aiding in quantum experiments, all that can be addressed in an automated way. And that's exactly uh, what, and the main thing that I think is the most exciting with these automated approaches is that you use raw data and you avoid maximally human biases. So maybe there are things that we can learn from this fresh, from this fresh approach, uh, which, would, which we are maybe missing as a community, because obviously we, we developed lots of heuristics, lots of uh, simplifications. Maybe we can improve this, uh, this description that we are using exactly with automated approaches. Uh, and of course, one of the automated approaches uh, that is super successful lately is, is machine learning. It's uh, in industry, um, it's so successful that people dub it as a new electricity. And of course, we have self-driving cars. Uh, right now, in a few cities in the world, they revolutionized how social media work and have lots, like large impact in the, in the everyday uh, life. By, but how these promises transform, uh, translate to quantum physics. So in terms of uh, phases, phases of matter, uh, they promise learning novel phases straight from experimental measurements. This would be amazing. Like, again, avoiding human biases and learning new things. This would be, this would be perfect. Uh, you've seen how uh, neural quantum states are being used for solving uh, large scale uh, um, quantum problems. And I think right now, of course, tensor networks are um, the to-go method, but the, if we would like to tackle 3D systems, I'm not sure if there is anything else right now than NQSs to go for. And with the experiments that we, that we are, that we are, that people are doing, <laughs> uh, there are lots of things that machine learning can help with, like starting from Hamiltonian learning. Imagine you have just snapshots of your experiments and there may be some noises that you are not aware of and all of, all of that can be automatically de de detected from your, from your data. This is, again, super amazing. You can maybe inspire new experiments uh, with automated approaches. And there are also lots of practical challenges like you know, improving readout from your quantum uh, microscope uh, that, that can be improved with ML. So lots of promises. However, we sh should keep in mind that ML is not only uh, you know, rainbows and unicorns. Uh, there are lots of problems that are being studied by the community, but you know, sometimes there's this, there's this enthusiasm that maybe outplays the, the, ca the caution. And to me, two main problems with ML is we lack, uh, we still lack interpretability, which is we don't exactly understand what they learn, and we lack reliable, reliable 
uh, solutions, meaning these methods do not give you out of the box the answer that the estimates, or they, they give you no guarantees that the prediction is actually correct. And even, maybe even worse, uh, there are lots of works showing that if you just perturb your image in a way that is in, like invisible to a human, it will completely de derail the network's prediction, which at least suggests that they are processing data in a very different way than humans do. So all, all of this we need to keep in mind when uh, using it for, uh, for quantum applications. And these challenges translate into, if we're using it for phase detection, we lack a formula for the detected order parameters. So we don't really know what correlators they're looking at when making their decisions. They are also struggling to learn some phases, especially topological phases are, are known to be challenging for, for ML. We don't know why. With uh, neural quantum states, as Agnes was, was showing, we don't understand really the optimization landscape. And we know it's hard, we don't know exactly why. Uh, there are open questions like if you switch architecture, what kind of biases are being introduced to your, uh, to your, to your, to your ansatz? And when it comes to using it for experiments, for example, again, this lack of reliability, lack, lack of uncertainty estimates, uh, basically tell you, you, you either trust the, 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 the model and run it at your experiment that may be very expensive, or, or you don't. So it's not really, it would be great to have some, uh, some estimates. And I think something very exciting for me uh, personally, yes, please. Of course. You're absolutely right, but uh, and if this would be the only case, then it's kind of no problem from, from the optimization side, but there are different problems. Like the landscape can be very like sharp and people, and people, and <laughs> those are my, my people, and they get stuck in some local minima, or maybe the ansatz, if you would like add more neurons, suddenly it would be able to describe the ground state, but without these few neurons, it's not able to. So there are lo lots of more failure modes, and we would like to understand which failure mode basically play the role, but you're absolutely right. Um, yes, and then there is this uh, uh, very uh, interesting for me, especially this transferability from known regimes to unknown regimes, because maybe you can get lots of data in some simpler problems and that we understand very well, and then use this, uh, this training data to, to have a model that maybe can generalize to things we don't know. Okay, so those are the promises and roadblocks to phases of ML for quantum physics, and uh, that was for the, uh, for the introduction. I'm going, doing great on time. Uh, <laughs> if there are any questions, please interrupt again. And uh, I will show you two, uh, two uh, sets of results that will tackle some sets of promises and the uh, roadblocks. So one thing uh, that I will present is our um, work on interpretable machine learning for phases of matter. Um, so with a special architecture that we called Tetris Convolutional Neural Network. So uh, we will try to learn both the phases and the order parameters that networks detect. And then the second part of the results will be uh, tackling Hamiltonian learning problem from the experimental snapshots uh, and with graph neural networks. And we'll tackle this transferability from known to unknown, which is uh, training on a regime that is simulatable and then transferring to larger uh, systems which we cannot simulate easily. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the uh, next part of the talk. I see no questions. Okay, great. So our Tetris CNN. So here I have to stress this, uh, this work uh, is being uh, done beautifully by my student Kacper Sebinski. He also ha has a poster on that, so if anything uh, here is unclear, go to him and uh, he will answer all your questions. This is also uh, in collaboration with uh, PhD, from, PhD uh, student James Nguyen from uh, University of South California. He's a computer science uh, student. And then we have physics gurus, uh, Antoine and Antoine. Uh, and uh, okay, so that was the, because then I will always forget to mention. So 
to reiterate the challenge. We are getting, we have, we're having experimental measurements or Monte Carlo samples because they are in the spin, uh, in the quantum simulators that are simulating spin models. So we are in the spin uh, real realm. And we would like, uh, those are for example the snapshots, right? And we are getting them by playing with some experimental parameter or in Monte Carlo. For example, those are the snapshots of a 2D Ising model <coughs> across the temperature. And with your uh, own eye, you can see uh, that, uh, that the distribution changes. Uh, so this is our training data. And what we want from the network is both saying, okay, there are two phases, but we also wanted to tell us, and it's magnetization that I looked at when making this decision. So that's the setup. And uh, of course, important disclaimer, uh, we are not the first to uh, notice it's a, it's a huge problem that we need to have interpretable machine learning if uh, learning phases of matter. And there are amazing work that we are bu building on, and uh, especially by uh, Sebastian Vettel and Cole Miles and Annabel Bort. Uh, but th there are things we basically want, to, there are features that we want to have within one tool and maybe improve upon the, these solutions uh, as well. So we would like to be able to detect complex order parameters without any human, let's say, uh, inspection of the filters, because if you do visual inspection of filters, this introduces human biases, which we really want to avoid. We also want to give you basically symbolic formula for the learned order parameter, which is, which is a new thing. We want it to be used for multiple, like, so it's usable when there are multiple phases in, the, in your data, when your measurements are in different bases, for example, or, uh, in Z and in X uh, bases, and uh, we want to be able to combine it with different kinds of tasks. So it can be unsupervised, can be self-supervised. We are just, we are giving the architecture that then can be used to your, to your advantage. Okay. And we, f we believe that yeah, the, 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 the solution is this Tetris CNN. So what is Tetris CNN? Uh, I'm, lucky, I'm lucky to present after Johannes, so already, and, of, and, and Eliska, if, if, you, if you've been to the school, so you exactly know how convolutional neural networks work. Um, but just to iterate, the main feature there is they have kernels or filters which you can think of as a sliding window that goes through your, through your uh, image or your, from your data sample. Normal CNNs have a kernels of fixed size, I mean, per, per layer. You can play with that, it's a hyperparameter, but in general, they are, have regular uh, shapes. What we suggest, let's do something crazy, and hopefully in a second you will see why. Let's uh, use kernels of different shapes, different sizes, all in one go, so they create parallel uh, paths of processing the data with different kind of shapes and kernels. And let's, on top of that, train them with a loss function that promote use of simple kernels and the smallest number, number of kernels. kernels. Uh, and now uh, I will show you how, what we gain out of it, in particular how we can map these kernels to specific correlators, spin correlators that are present in the data. So we are working on specific kinds of data, spin measurements. So we only have plus, plus, and mi plus and minus ones. Because of that, you know that if you have a sliding window of one by one, so you're always processing just one spin of a time, at a time, and if you go for a very general representation of, of a possible learned function, which is Taylor expansion, you see that every higher term, again, because it's S can be only mass minus one and one, all higher terms that will collapse the first two. So basically, every even one will become one, and every odd power will basically collapse to, uh, to Si, which means that the, the only function that can be learned by this kernel is uh, something related to magnetization. And we can go further which is we take two by one kernel, we again do the expansion, and we see again the higher order terms collapsing to smaller ones, which means that in general, this can only learn something related to magnetization or the nearest neighbor correlators. Uh, this, this, uh, just to, this uh, 
This is a crucial remark, and it was made by Sebastian Wetzel in, in, in the paper I showed you. But now what's cool, if you, if you allow a network for, a con for the in, uh, simultaneous use of both kinds of kernels, and you promote usage of simpler ones, and, even, and despite that, your, the net network tells you it wants to use two by one, it means that in fact, oh, yes, it means that in fact, the dominant correlator was the nearest neighbor correlator. Does it make sense? If it, if, if it, would, if it would be enough to learn the magnetization, it would, it would kill off the two by one kernel and it would only use the one by one kernel. And if it didn't kill off the two by one kernel, it means it had to learn this higher possible order correlator. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's reassuring. <laughs> so that's how you, now you see why allowing for a CNN to use very various correlator, uh, very various kernels is actually allowing it to use various types of correlators. And you already see that those correlators will be local as long as you, your kernels are not huge in size, which they won't be because it's very expensive. So there is this, let's say, limitation. So now you know, now you see the Tetris CNN is an architecture that uses different kernels, which can be then mapped to different correlators in the, in the, in the spin data. And I think here two disclaimers are, are in place. So uh, I'm trying, I, whenever I can, I'm trying to make connection to previous talks so maybe less experienced people in the audience can kind of order all this knowledge in their brain. So uh, Roberto on Monday was showing you how to use general data science tools to extract relevant correlators. That's a, that's, this work is along these lines. Just I want, I'm forcing the CNN to do it for us and then doing some task with these correlators. And then, of course, you can think of this uh, in the, in the, along the terms that Ever presented, which is we're exactly doing representation learning and making the representation learning as an explicit step, which is exactly learn specific correlators and then do whatever you want with them. Okay, and I will just, it's, it's, it seems like reiterating, but I will use this graphic throughout. So just uh, this, the, in practice, what, what happens, in the left you have this correlation extraction network, which is CNN with these different kernels. Then the, the outputs from all parallel, pa parallel paths are being smashed together into a bottleneck. And then this bottleneck, which is basically a set of functions of correlators, is being used by task network to do, to do their stuff. Um, maybe I won't go into super detail uh, in, the, in the structure, but this is, this is the uh, uh, more explicit explanation of the architecture. And uh, please bother Katzper, uh, who has it on, on his poster and he's very well uh, like prepared to tell you about all the, all the steps here. Um, Okay, so now the final thing before going to results, just to tell you, is uh, the task that you want, that you can do with this architecture is up to you. Uh, you usually, I mean, this was thought to do phase classification from on, on spin data. Uh, so as uh, to make it unsupervised, which we followed the method by Eliska Greplova, who, and she presented that during the school, which is pr called prediction-based method. And it basically tells you that you need to do a regression uh, to predict the external experimental parameter that was used to generate your data. So there's no information on the, on the face per se. So this is the regression that you do. And if you inspect the error, you can exactly see the, tran the phase transition. So because it always messes it, up, messes it up at the phase transition. So this is the task we're gonna use our architecture for. Okay, and the results. We will start with, um, as you see, the models are extremely complex. Uh, this will be 1D transverse field Ising model and 2D transverse field Ising model. Uh, but there is a good reason for that. So I will start with 1D uh, data simulated with DMRG because I think we all have pretty good intuition what's going on there and you will see what, uh, what our method is, uh, is showing. Uh, and then we will show you the data from group of Antoine Brouet, 
where they using simulated Rydberg, uh, where they using Rydberg atoms simulated 2D transverse field icing on a square lattice. This generates lots of more, uh, you know, r um, defects and noise, and we'll see how our method will work there. Okay, so let's start with 1D transverse field icing. This will be pretty quick, and then I will focus more on the second part. So again, the, our task is to predict, so our transverse field icing has this Hamiltonian, and the task is to, pre, to, uh, to predict the corresponding strength of the transverse field uh, based on the projective measurement of our 1D icing. And projective measurements at this slide are made in a Z basis. So basically, tell me for which G was this, this uh, snapshot generated. And this is the, uh, these are the activations, so in activations of our bottleneck that can be mapped to kernels that are being used. So different colors are different kernels, different kernel sizes. And we see that immediately ac across the training, like at the beginning of the training, immediately kernel one by one is being picked up as a dominant one, and then it's being preserved uh, when it reaches uh, kind of, a, there is, uh, because we, we regularize both the general weights of the network and that we, we penalize the kernels. So there, there is in general at some point, an equi let's say equilibrium, but it's not equilibrium, it's a wrong, wrong word. Uh, balance uh, uh, and, and basically it means that it learns something related to, uh, to mag magnetization. If we want to be very thorough, and I will show you that for experimental data, then we can put on top of our network symbolic regression and get exactly the function of, of what is the function based on magnetization that our network is, is learning. So what will happen if now, instead of the uh, measurements in Z, we, we put measurements in Y. Those are exactly the same, the same model, the same task, just measurement in different bases. No longer, there is no magnetization in Y that could help you uh, solve your task. And as you see in the beginning, because the loss promotes simple kernels, it's really trying to get something out of one, one by one kernel, but it quickly, quickly gives up and the, tries other kernels and finally the kernel two by one uh, survives this, this uh, slaughter. And uh, so we know that it will learn something related to this uh, nearest neighbor spin correlations. Um, so this, was, uh, this is a very like, high level uh, view on possible uh, results for the 1D, trans, uh, trans, 1D transverse field icing. And let me now go into more detail into what your analysis could be for 2D uh, transverse field icing from experimental True, true experimental data. Okay, so the, the experimental um, setup are exactly Rydberg atoms in a square lattice, and uh, when you, you initialize them in the, in the paramagnetic phase, and those red arrows show you the uh, time evolution of the, of the system under uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian, and those are the parameters that are being changed to transfer your state from one phase to another. Um, yes, and the task of ours will be to exactly predict these experimental knobs that are being turned during your simulation based on your snapshots uh, um, obtained, obtained in the experiment. And then this is the task, but of, again, when you look closely at the error, you see very nicely the transition. But we will focus on understanding what it learned to predict this phase transition. So again, we have the same plot for, uh, this time we unfortunately have only measurements in Z, because that's what, what experimentalists uh, mm, measured. Uh, and the task is to predict corresponding uh, omega and delta. So as you see, it, in the beginning it was much more uh, confused, but it, in the end uh, it did learn dominantly the magnetization. However, if you look closely, you see it didn't kill out fully the kernel one by two, which is uh, basically, it's, uh, it's again uh, encoding nearest neighbor uh, interaction, but only like in a, within a row, not, not within a column. 
that the Uven column got killed. I guess one was enough. So the loss function killed it off. Okay, and now finally the promised uh, symbolic regression leading to promised symbolic formula for the, for the uh, correlator and for the network. So first we think we can do is uh, we will do, in, uh, in the first step, we will try to understand how the input is being processed and encoded in the bottleneck. So what makes this job much easier is ag again knowing that this is the dominant correlator that is being used. If I had no idea it's what, what is going on, this would be a very hard fitting and symbolic regression is unstable if you have many, many possible variables. So this, this is very helpful. And as you see, uh, it, it learned a, a, a linear function of the, of the magnetization exactly. And this is the fitting between the values of this bottleneck and, the, uh, and, the, and, and this function exactly. And then as, you, I, as I showed you, there are some, the, the kernel one by two wasn't completely uh, destroyed. So we can also fit that. Uh, it's, and this is again, uh, a linear function of the, so this, this more, more or less just confirms our intuitions that if this is the kernel that survived, the, this is the, uh, it will be exactly encoded in the bottleneck up to you know, some constant and uh, multiply, multiplier. What's more interesting now, given that we kind of expected it to happen, is to do the second, second step, which is given that we now know what are the bottlenecks, we have two values, right? We have one uh, that's related to the magnetization, the other to the nearest, next near, nearest neighbor uh, correlator. Now let's see how the network is using that to do the task. So we will learn the functions of this uh, delta and omega with respect to the correlators. Uh, and let's do it step by step because we can use, if, if, we, if we do it in the, let's say, in the first order approximation, we will just use one kernel. And if in the second order approximation, we will use both kernels to approximate the, the network. So this is the first, this is the shape of the, of the, of the first kernel. And when, when we, uh, and we had two regression parameters, right, the delta and omega, so we have two fits. One is very nice and uh, almost perfect, the other a bit more messy, but when we uh, add the, and this is basically the whole formula for your network that you can uh, admire if you, if, if, if you dare admiring something to the ninth power. Uh, and if you now add the second kernel, so let's say second order, better approximation to your, to your network, you're getting much better approximation for the, for the omega. And this is the, again, nine, ninth order uh, function of your, uh, of your magnetization. So all in all, you are getting the full formula that your network is computing in its mind <laughs> to, uh, to, compu to, to, to solve the task at hand. And you can ask many questions at this point, at the, like what are the, is there dependence between the kernels that are being picked up and how strong we penalize them? So because there is this penalty on the both number and complexity of, of, of kernels. Uh, and whether this penalty destroys your accuracy because the more you penalize, the less kernels you allow for and the less wiggle room your network has to do the task. But as, as you see on the, so this is kind of, uh, for this is zero penalty, uh, let's say. And uh, as you see, if compared to the largest penalty that we consider, the, the drop in performance is very little. So somehow the sparsity doesn't impact it too much. And then this is the plot of used kernels. And uh, I think maybe what's the most important, that mag the blue one is magnetization and is being picked up as a, as a dominant one at kind of small, small penalty. But if you would do your zero, zero penalty, you, so you, like your default CNN, this would be, this would be like it, it was using all possible kernels and basically learning some kind of combi linear combination of, of various, various correlators. Okay. So this was Ising model and we can say, yes, we have interpretable CNN. 
that can detect both order parameters and the phases of matter. But in practice, what I'm saying, yes, our network learned magnetization of the Ising model. So that's a bit less uh, impressive than the first statement. But now we, we try to make something really interesting uh, out of it is we are tackling XY model uh, and experimental measurements from this uh, simulation from the group of Antoine Brave again. And there are lots of things to build upon and to improve and to uh, extend. So this was square lattices, but lots of interesting th things uh, in the simulations happen for different for lattices of dif different geometries. And we, we, should, we should definitely ex extend to these different kinds. And this model, the other parameters we're de detecting, the correlators, are definitely local ones, but there are ways to expand it to non-local or to like string order parameters and maybe to topological order parameters. So this is something we will definitely think about. And of course, uh, you know, uh, if you don't know what to do, you can put transformer in it. But no, to be, uh, to be very honest, like there is, uh, there is a way to understand that the attention in the transformer is actually like filters in CNN, but very adaptive ones. So you could try to uh, implement the same idea with a transformer, transformer uh, architecture. And if we suc succeed, and I hope it, it, that will happen, uh, we basically hope to make it a, a go-to tool for experimentalists as a first analysis of their, of their data for, to look for phases and correlators that are important. Or maybe if you use it, you, I think what, what's also powerful, you, you, it doesn't have to be for, uh, used only for phase detection. You can use this architecture for various spin model related problems and, this, and get these correlators that are uh, creating the decision process of your network for free. Okay, so that was the second, second project. If there, uh, that was the first project, sorry. There are any questions? Because if not, then I will gonna, I'm gonna switch gears. 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So the second thing I'd like to uh, show you is uh, basically how we uh, how ad address Hamiltonian learning problem with neural networks, and uh, this is a project done in collaboration with with uh, Joey Tindall, Anirvan, and Antoine. Uh, and let me remind you what 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 is the task. So Hamiltonian learning is the task of identifying the Hamiltonian governing the system from the system's measurements. And there are two, uh, let's say, general, uh, there are two kinds of this task in general. And one is, you know the symbolic formula, you know the terms, and you just want to learn the coefficients. And there is more tricky one, which is you don't know the terms and you want to learn them. And if you remember talk by Zala Lenarcic from Monday, she was learning actually that, that, that new terms that are entering the, the, the Hamiltonian that need to be in Hamiltonian to represent the, the data. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm finishing, I'm focusing on this, on this first easier problem, but it will be very, very experimentally motivated. There is a specific challenge to be solved and I will tell you in a second. Um, so um, before, uh, just to have some kind of, uh, to, to show you against, uh, like not against, what we want to improve upon. Uh, so in 1D systems, Hamiltonian learning is much, much, much easier than, in, than, any, uh, than uh, outside because tensor networks are super powerful in 1D. So basically what you, what you can do, you can simulate your system, play with automatic differentiation, and find the, and basically compare the predictions of tensor networks with experiment and do this loop and find the proper coefficients of the Hamiltonian. This is the, this is the main thing behi behind this, uh, this paper um, that I'm, I'm showing you, but, but it has, of course, it, there are still some open problems even in this 1D, which is you need to optimize many parameters at once, uh, but also there is the problem of, of scalability of tensor networks to higher dimensions. But then there was Hamiltonian learning done in, in, in 2D, uh, by actually uh, Agnes in, uh, here. And you can use CNNs. This, the, uh, Eliska also presented this, this, this work, so people from school know that, know that already. 
Uh, and this is a super nice example where, where you have uh, deep learning uh, predicting uh, the parameters of the Hamiltonian based on your, on your correlators gathered from the data. Uh, and that's, I think that, that was very inspiring for, for us. Um, but the, the, the problem still remains to scale it up uh, besides the 2D ladder systems and basically to really grow in all directions. And maybe having one model for all Hamiltonian parameters would be actually beneficial because this model would help, each other, would help itself if in predicting uh, some parameters while, while having a knowledge how to get another parameter. So that's the direction we're going to. And it's amazing that I'm, I'm after Johannes uh, once more uh, because I don't need to really introduce to you graph neural networks, but I will do it a bit anyhow. Uh, so graph neural network has this special layer that accepts a graph and outputs the graph of the same shape. So it preserves the graph structure of your data. But what it does uh, instead is it's basically changing the values of it of the nodes and changing the, the values of the links on the way. So it's basically learning a useful representation of the, no uh, of the nodes and possibly of the links if that's your architectural, ar architectural choice. How it updates, the represent how it learns the, the new representation of your, of your graph is via so-called message passing. So uh, you can imagine for a second, because we're gonna again work on spin models, you can think of it as a free spin chain that will be processed by your network and it will, it will output again some uh, representation of your free spin, uh, free spin uh, model. So what the message passing does, uh, each of the spins will send a message to its neighbor and this message is nothing else as a neural network that inputs, uh, inputs information about one spin and out, outputs this updated representation of the second spin. So as you see, uh, it's being sent to all its neighbors and importantly for scaling then, uh, I will tell, uh, that's why we are using this, ne this network to scale it up. All these networks have the same parameters. So from, from, the, from, the, from the perspective of this graph neural network, it doesn't care if it's three spins or 1,000. It will only, it will have the same network sending messages between the, between the neighbors. And I think what you may already see is there is this step that we'll need to aggregate messages. And there is, a, there is an awesome thing because it can see boundary effects. Because this, these two spins, will have just one message because they have just one, one neighbor and this, and this middle spin will have message from both neighbors. So there's again this physical intuition behind that, that that's super nice. This aggregation of messages can be again something learnable or you can think of it as just, for example, summing up or some average. Okay, so that was a very uh, fast introduction to graph neural networks. And I will just su flash super fast the, the results so uh, to leave some space for questions. The problem we have uh, is out of the snapshots gathered across some uh, time evolution under time, de time dependent Hamiltonian. This is again kind of, uh, this is again the same data Ising model in the, uh, in the uh, Rydberg simulator. The, they have this problem, which is they tell you they put atoms in specific positions but in reality, they don't know exactly where they put these atoms. <laughs> so there is this 200 nanometer uncertainty in the positions of tweezers where they trap their ultra cold atoms. What we want, and sometimes this, this doesn't sound like much, but it introduces a small frustration to the, to the, to the system. And it may mess up if you have very um, sensitive phases to create, for example. So we'd like to help them in identifying how they shifted uh, accidentally these, these tweezers. So we want to predict the, actually what are the true RIJs in the, in, the, in the simulated system out of measurements done across the time evolution. 
And uh, if, you, if you remember morning talk, this is actually kind of opposite problem that Johannes was explaining because he out, he, uh, the, his version would be out of RIJs predict the correlators. And I'm saying out of correlators predict RIJs. Actually wasn't aware of your work, so I'm very, well, I was very happy to learn that. So again, the GNN for the task. Now those are spins. Uh, we will ex we will uh, and we will put the various correlators in the into the graph to learn uh, on on that basis. But in so this we t I told you how to change the representation of your of your data. But I didn't tell you how to make a prediction based on that. And what will happen is we will put another neural network on top of every pair of spins, and its task will be to predict the distance between them. And again for scalability those will be identical neural network, that, that they will just differ by the pair that we input. So again, those networks are, are identical, and those networks are, are identical. So in theory, this architecture is very scale invariant. It doesn't care if it's 100 by 100 or 3 by 3. Uh, and let's now play with two, two, two types of data that we can input. We started just with the magnetization per spin across time. And this gave us a pretty nice results so far. So this is the prediction on the RIJs. Those are like truly physical units, which I'm amazed at. Uh, and it was pretty nice, but with the mean absolute error of like 20 nanometers. But you can actually get much better if you will take uh, advantage of the presence of links and you add next nearest neighbors additionally on top of this representation. And after adding these correlators, you're getting basically, this is like the best regression results I have ever had in my life. Uh, and you get, go back, like you, your, your error is like three nanometers, which is unnoticeable. They are so extremely happy with this, uh, with this um, precision. But just to, uh, I kind of shifted under the rug what are the data. So the data are free by free, and it's exact diagonalization, exact time, dyna time dynamics. Super expensive to do in practice, to do for larger systems. Um, and I will skip for a second, like understanding how many samples you need. But basically, the the this, this slides are just showing you that this next nearest neighbors hold much more information than just magnetization, and are very needed to get this RIJs. Uh, and we did all that to be able to scale up. So the MPSs can do maybe, you know, up to eight by eight, but when you start doing time evolution, it's just super expensive. Uh, so we wanted to train on smaller and go up. And now I will go to the glorious slide that we show how we train on three by three and we scale up to four by four. Ta-da! That's not what it should look like. So in other words, we don't have any scaling up to larger systems at this point. But it's not that surprising because the, the, all the data, all, all the network seen in its life was just free by free data. It's never seen anything smaller or larger. It wasn't aware of any scale invariance. Uh, so this is definitely a work in progress. I, and I believe when, you, when we start including four by four, five by five, it will get better in seeing larger sizes. But I have no idea whether it will be practical in a sense if, if we is six by six enough to predict 15 by 15? And where is this, you know, probably could happen where the boundaries are not that relevant uh, for what's going on in the bulk. And this is when this method will finally start uh, showing the scalability. But uh, yeah, so the summary, uh, graph neural networks great for Hamilton, for incorporating structure of your, of your data if it's, if, uh, and, and understanding the, uh, what's close to each other. And long to-do list. <laughs> and just, uh, I think I will skip that, but basically, except for, uh, next to ML for quantum, I'm also studying, and uh, I'm trying to understand ML because it just puzzles me. There are so many un uh, open and unanswered questions. Uh, so please talk to me uh, about any of that if you feel like it. And uh, yeah, I think people who have been at school are already tired with this uh, recommendation, but if you are in that school, I highly recommend the, the, the book. We had an amazing team uh, that we worked with on that. And thank you for, for your attention.
to Ladania for this super nice talk. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, so the inputs were in the end this, which is at each node you had magnetization per spin across time. So it's like, and Over. yes, per, per t yes, def definitely. And then you have nearest neighbor correlators. So then of course the question is we could include more uh, like higher order correlators, but there's nothing to improve here. So. Um, yes, and uh, so this is the, the, these results are for um, 1,000 snapshots per, uh, per, per realization. But I think though this is, I mean, this is a super important question, but connecting it to experiment is like full of problems. Because also because they don't know full Hamiltonian they have, like not only RRJs, but there, there are tilts in global pulses, all, all those, and I, I, I'm hoping that this will be averaged out and maybe, uh, and then will Eddie help pick up RJ, RJs, but I don't know actually. So, but yeah, that's also an important thing on the way to address. Any more questions? Yeah, so that's, uh, so there are two, two answers. Like one thing that you could think of, and this is what we're thinking about, is changing how kernels work and trying to make them more like a established way of, uh, of studying topological order, like with making them maybe work more like Wilson loops, but I don't know enough for now to make a, a valid statement. But then there are those different kind of, uh, different formulations. And in, in, in Ising gauge theory, you have those plaquettes, and I think plaquettes are totally detectable with this with this approach. Because what it will say you basically, if it plaquette is two by two, everything that will be smaller than two by two gets killed off because it doesn't have enough information. And then you need to do analysis of two by two and what it really encodes and hopefully it encodes like the you know product of the of the four four spins there. So there are ways, yes, I think. Can you say the same beginning? Uh, so in the in the first step, if you just look at what uh, what uh, shapes are being used, then it's just uh, qualitatively. But then when you put a symbolic regression on top of that, it's exact equation. Uh, but it's also important. So this exact equation will tell you. What is being, what the network is doing for the task. So this is the exact equation that that is relating the uh, external, like experimental parameter to the correlator, and it's exactly a symbolic formula that is that is under the hood. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not necessarily like a cumulant of the order parameter. It will probably pop up if you do the phase classification with your network, not regression on the parameters. So there are this, I think there's this task dependency on, on picked up correlators. And then maybe you can force it to like look at cumulants. So. All right, then in the spirit of time, let's move further discussions to the break. Uh, and let's thank Anya again. And <laughs>